Welcome to Ian and Friends. I am Ian Dilly, senior editor at Flow Bikes. And I am Michael Sheehan, Ian's friend. We are here with a wonderful show for you today. What do we have on tap? Uh, first off, live on Flow Bikes. The best one day, one week race <laughs> in the world, I would have to say. Tour of the Basque Country, yeah. otherwise known as Vuelta al País Vasco. Excellent Spanish. Yeah, and I mean, this kicks off a really exciting spring and summer road racing schedule for us. We just recently picked up Pais Basco. We have Tour of the Alps coming up uh, just a week after Pais Basco. I believe it's April 16th through 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Hammer Series in May. Uh, and then returning in October, we just learned today that the Hammer Series is hosting an event in Hong Kong. Really? At the end of the season. No True way. True story. And we also have the Tour de Suisse in June. Okay. Uh, we'll be looking forward to watching Peter Sagan there, seeing if he can improve upon his 15 total career stage wins okay. at the Tour de Suisse. And we also have the Giro Rosa. Yeah, the, the big one. Mm -hmm. Big one for the women. Yeah, yeah, in, uh, in July. So lots of road racing on Flow Bikes. Uh, this week, or today, we will also be talking about Holy Week, of course. Mm -hmm. It is classic season in Belgium. Uh, Flanders just happened. Roubaix about to happen. We'll talk about our picks and what's going on there. And I guess we'll talk about Chris Froome again. But I guess so. Just, yeah. yeah, just a little bit. And we'll also announce the winners of our coffee mug competition. Yeah, so yes. stay tuned for that. Yes. It's exciting. Um, all right. Well, yeah. What have you been watching on uh, the internet this week? Pais Vasco, man. That is, I, I love this race, honestly. It's, if I were to race it, I would hate it. Just <laughs> absolutely like the worst race that I could possibly think of doing, but it's really fun to watch on a couch. It is just like, the most savage week of racing on the World Tour calendar, essentially. Just sawtooth profiles. Uh, we're two stages in. And yeah, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, these first two days have been amazing. We saw the same winner both days, actually first and second place, mm -hmm. uh, both Monday and today. But the racing was super dramatic. Both stages uh, were incredibly hard, just up and down the whole day. Um, ended with these ridiculously steep climbs that just shredded the field and then technical descents and, uh, and a two-up sprint finish. So today or yesterday we saw uh, Julian Alaphilippe and uh, Primoz Roglic going head-to-head -head in the sprint and uh, Alaphilippe coming over the top. This is yesterday's stage. I mean, the other thing about the Basque Country is the passion of the fans. Yeah. I mean, you get uh, Tour de France level crowds on these stage finishes, um, you know, and the gradients of the climbs. Of course, the fans are going to show up because these guys are going like four miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> these all the climbs are like 20% in gradient. Yeah, for, for bang for your buck for standing on the side of the road, you're going to get to see a lot of people slogging up just like massively steep grades. And yeah, these two are stealing the show so far. Yeah, and it's not like they're beating up on uh, watered down competition. We've got uh, Nairo Quintana here, Mikel Landa, Roman Bardet, some guy named Richie Port. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a star-studded field, so it's yeah, it's pretty impressive that these two, at least in the first two days, showed up with the legs to really crush all comers. Yeah, and I think what I like about this race is it isn't. It's totally different from like Tour de France climbing where you have a Team Sky who can just put all their guys on every single climb, just like ride tempo up it. There's no riding tempo up these hills. It is like, the hill, the roads are like as, as are wide about, as our table I is I think long. smaller than this table. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe smaller than the table and they're just savagely steep. I can't like emphasize that enough. It's just survival of the fittest. There's not really any tactics. The person who has the legs to attack when it ratchets up to 25, percent like you can't fake it either you can follow them or you can't there are no full teams there yeah i mean i know that the majority of the bike uh fan bike racing fan populace their focus is probably on flanders and roubaix this week but let's not forget that these six days in between flanders and roubaix we sort of have the classics of stage races i mean these stages are wildly unpredictable because the profiles 
are so jagged and the climbs are so you know steep and severe, it, it is incredibly hard for the teams to control this race. So we're not really seeing formulaic racing, even though we've seen the same two winners each day. Um, it's it's really unpredictable, uncontrolled style of racing. Yeah, can we throw up uh, Lawson Craddock? Our good friend sent us some power numbers from today's stage that I would like to take a look at. It just shows it's about the first hour, hour and a half. Yeah. And yeah. This, this is Lawson trying to make the breakaway today uh, for 75 minutes. And yeah, I, you, t you're, you're, you are a pro cyclist. Tell me what these numbers mean to a pro cyclist. <laughs> hard start. That, that's a hard start. So if you aren't familiar, this is from Training Peaks. Uh, the kind of gray gradient, uh, the spiky thing, that's the elevation profile of the stage. So this highlighted section starts right as he hits the first climb. And when you have, <laughs> when you have a climb that looks like that in the first 20K of a stage race, it is going to be mayhem at the start. Everybody's fighting for position on these little tiny roads. And yeah, you just have to like hold on for dear life. So we saw him, he averaged 350 watts for the first hour, 15 minutes of this race. And that is, that's saying a lot because there are like three major descents in it and he's still having that high of a power. Uh, 400 normalized, so that kind of takes away some of the descents to show like a theoretical, like if the road was flat, more or less. Right, he, so he, 400 he, watts for 75 minutes. Yeah. That, <laughs> and then you have to race another three hours after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, have to, you have to recover and be able to finish the yeah. day. Uh, hard rate just pinned at 170 beats per minute. It's a hard start, and that's kind of what we're seeing for this whole week, except for stage four. Stage four is going to be super interesting. We have a pan-flat time trial. It's, I think, like the longest stretch of flat road in the entire week of racing. It's 20K. Yeah, they actually have to fly out of the Basque Country to find some <laughs> flat roads to do the time trial on, and then they're flying back to the to the mountains to continue the racing. <laughs> they actually just <laughs> took them over to Belgium. Or something. Yeah, but it's uh, it's a really interesting dynamic, and um, you know, you called this out earlier, but you know, Roglic is a phenomenal time trialist. Yeah. So the fact that he's already, you know, has, is sitting in second place overall, has, I think, 40 seconds over third place, he's in prime position to really smash everyone on Thursday. Yeah, he, he's my pick for the TT. I think Ian agrees with me there. We'll see uh, how well Al Philippe manages to hold on. And the big question after that is, does Lotto have the team to support Roglic after the TT, should he take the yellow jersey? Yeah, let's fast forward. You know, Friday is another challenging day, but the Queen stage Saturday is going to be insane. Eight categorized climbs and um, ending on the monster of them all. It's not a super long, demanding climb, but yeah, let's zoom in here. Um, we have the Alta Usarza. Three kilometers long, almost 13% in gradient. <laughs> <laughs> That's miserable. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, yeah. If, yeah, people are going to be coming in in ones and twos on this race. Um, the, here's a little profile of the last climb. The yeah, red, is, red It is so steep at the start, and you get like a little bit of reprieve in the middle, and then it goes right back to being steep. So whoever has the legs for the last what 13k of this race is probably going to win it it's going to be miserable and i think one thing that we should highlight is before you even get to that last climb there are three koms in the first 25k right. of stage uh six it's going to be mayhem like the the numbers that we saw from lawson today it's going to be people are going to be having to do that and probably more on the last stage of this race and that's my big question if Lotto is defending the jersey for Roglic on the last day, they are going to have their work cut out for them and like a miserable day in the office just in the first 25K of that race because everybody is going to be trying to just like screw over whatever team is winning that race because it'll be so easy to do. You can't, there'll be guys like 15 minutes off the back, 50K into the race. Yeah, yeah, and um, I love the fact that this race ends on, on this climb, like you, you make it to the top of this climb and that's the end of the race. I mean, 
we all know that Movistar likes to play the tactic of sending like four or five guys up the road. We've seen them use that uh, effect at the Vuelta last mm -hmm. year where, um, you know, there would be, you know, three Movistar riders in the break. And by the time it all came back together on the last climb, they had, you know, obviously the numbers on hand. So it'll be interesting to see if they start deploying those tactics in terms of sending guys up the road early. Today we saw that um, Sky actually had two riders up the road early, but um, but team tactics are definitely going to come into play here, even though it's such a mountainous race. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're able to back up at all, Jordan, but... Jordan runs our assets, by the way. <laughs> we did want to talk about Al Felipe's mustache. Yes. Uh, I, I think that's why you're calling him Al Felipe. Is because yeah, that's true. Of his mustache. That's true. Al Felipe. Al so, but as long as he has the mustache, it might be Al I Felipe. Think, I think we can pronounce that E as a hard consonant because, uh, yeah, it's just uh, phenomenal. So you... you you did some uh, research into this. There was some strong oh. reporting from the Quick Step team as to uh, his interesting facial hair at this race. Yes, yeah, so Al Felipe prepared a statement. Uh, yeah, let's read it. <laughs> regarding his mustache. Uh, imagine this is in a French accent. <laughs> Everyone in the Peloton asked me what was with the mustache after my teammates the other day. Now the other riders came to me and asked if there was any reason behind this new, new look. To be frank, there wasn't any. And I wasn't even focused on it, but now that I won, I'll keep it. So from Flow Bikes, can someone please beat Al Felipe <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and make him shave that thing off his face? <laughs> I am personally kind of hoping that he just uh, has a run, wins the next four stages, and uh, you know, maybe we'll see him at, the, at Liege, Bastogne Liege, Amstel Gold, you know, the Ardennes Classics. Uh, maybe he'll keep it till the tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but maybe he'll win the tour, actually. Maybe he should just keep that on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's 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 probably the most French goatee I've maybe ever seen. It's yeah. pretty incredible. Okay. Um, all right, moving on. What else do we have? Uh, oh, by the way, tune in to Flow Bikes for Pais Basco. We are exclusively live in the U.S., so um, you can find that on our events page. Uh, sign up for the pro. Um, package yeah, and, yeah get yourself a subscription and because you're in america this is pertinent we have nine americans in pais vasco right now good call yeah uh do you actually you have the list I right the we, we kind of compiled this you want to just run down the homeboys lawson craddock chad haga nate brown sep Kuss, ian boswell alex house peter stetna tj van garderen and benjamin king nine americans and you could also probably throw in there uh, North American, Canadian, Michael Woods. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We'll, we'll claim him. He raced domestically in America for a few I years. I mean, is He's... it just like half a stance that nine Americans ended up at this one stage race? I've never seen anything like this in, in Europe. It's, it's pretty, maybe, yeah, it's yeah, phenomenal. Good for them, and I'm looking forward. <laughs> Seb Kuss kind of got thrown into the fire here. This is his first year in the World Tour, yeah. and he's potentially going to be having to defend a uh, yellow true. jersey That's true. in one of the hardest week-long stage races but in I the mean, world. So. You've probably been in that situation before where it's easy to be in these races and sort of just um, hanging on, trying to finish the race. You don't really have a role, but if you've got the leader on your team, yep. it gives you a reason to go to the front, to gain some confidence, even if it's just for the first 30K of the stage. Uh, at least he has a reason to get to the front of the race and ride hard. Absolutely, and actually, if... For me, it was always so much easier just being told, like, here's your job. We have a jersey. Like, you have to get your guy to this point in the race. That that was a lot more digestible to me than being like, okay, you're kind of just learning. Go, <laughs> yeah. go try to do something. Totally. So, yeah, we actually could see some cool rides from Seth w this week, which I'd be really happy to see because he is such a phenomenal climber. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he has a, he's had a bit of a rough go in the World Tour so far. I think uh, he did finish Strade Bianchi. Uh, well, his first it, road race was seconds. like three years ago. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, it's it's this is going to be a tough year for him. But, uh, but no, yeah, he, to be thrown right into the, the Wolves' den like that with the, the, the level of the races he's doing. Yeah, he's doing all the right things. I remember doing Redlands with him just in 2016, and he won the Oakland yeah. Mountaintop finish, and everyone was like, Who's Sepp Kuss? Well, 
now now we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. We've got uh, Flanders review, and then we'll do a Perry Roubaix preview. Um, Flanders didn't disappoint. No, it didn't. Um, Nibbly got nibbly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so at Milan San Remo, we saw, you know, Nibbly latch on to the back of an attack by the Latvian national champion Chris Nielens uh, from the Israel, Israel cycling team. Um, Nielens, for some reason, even swapped poles with Nibbly, oh. and then Nibbly just rode away from him. And, uh, you know, that was the end of Nielens' day. Yeah. But it was it was it was interesting to see at Flanders, um, you know, twenty five k out. Um, you know, kudos to Nibali. He he punched it. Yeah, he he knows when to make the move. He's he's just one of those like old classy bike racers. He just knows where to be and when. And he made a great move, but Terpstra called him out on it. And oh my God, when Terpstra went, there was obviously no bringing him back. Um, yeah, and the thing that's interesting what set that whole chain of events up is that, you know, for as much as Sagan has sort of been griping after the race that no one wanted to work with him, that there was, you know, everybody was just watching him, you know, his teammate Daniel Oss chased, who was it, Sky, Trek Segafredo, and, um, you know, EF Cannondale for almost 10K. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Quickstep was just getting a free ride. Um, you know, they come within, you know, shouting distance, and Terpster Attack rides right through the break and is never seen again with, you know, three, uh, three Quickstep blocking for him. So maybe not the best tactics from Sagan and company? He, I see what you're saying. He's just stuck between such a rock and a hard place, though, in these races because he's still got, he is essentially, he's the team leader. He's in the elite group with a bunch of other team leaders that are all isolated. They've lost their teammates. And then there's four quick step riders. And I think if you're Sagan, you're hoping that maybe the odd like leader from Trek or someone else who's in the same position, like you can form a little alliance and just help me to help you kind of thing. Right. And he just isn't really getting that. And a quick step is just, they're the team sky of the classics. They are so good at positioning they have really strong guys who are all kind of capable in their own right of winning and yeah if you're Sagan you can't follow every move and you have to get a little bit of collaboration from your the other lonely leaders yeah there I mean it's hard to feel sorry for the guy that is potentially the strongest and also has the best sprint <laughs> <laughs> I mean given he doesn't have the best team but uh, I don't know I mean I just feel like race smarter, you know, and, and, and I was even thinking maybe, you know, with his sort of post-race comments, uh, bagging on other teams for, you know, watching him too much, m you know, is that just him venting or is, are those mind games? Like, is yeah. he trying to get, um, you know, it's, it's that thing, like when you're in the breakaway and you want someone to work a little bit harder than maybe they should, if he's sort of calling the other teams out for, you know, not helping him chase or this or that, maybe next time um, they're in a break like that, are they going to put their nose in the wind a little bit more and, and, and help chase back quick step? We'll see. We'll see, this. It, we'll see on Sunday. It, it's tough. I don't know. I, I was watching Terpstra just storm away with yeah. that. And, you, you know, the group behind, they're all racing for third, essentially. And, yeah, if the helps have gone, they're probably still racing for right. a, a lower podium place. But... My, my attitude has always been you got to like keep yourself in the race. If there's a guy riding away if, with 10k to go, you're not going to win unless you work. So you got to, yeah, got to put your nose in the wind at some point. And yes, yeah, Sagan, we've seen him do the lion's share of the work before when he gets people to work with him, but it's just getting a rotation going. So yeah, well, I mean, this brings us yeah. to to Sunday. Your your pick for Roubaix. I think Sagan's going to take it. You think? I, I, I do. He looks so comfortable in the last few races that he's done. Uh, I don't think that we've really gotten to see him just have a clean shot since, uh, I guess, Ken Wevel again. That, he won that, right? Yeah. With a, I mean, with a massive sprint. So if he gets to the sprint, he's definitely my call for winning it because he has the sprint right now. 
Right. And but I mean, ha I mean, yeah, I mean, Roubaix, the cha odds of Roubaix ending in a sprint, especially with how strong Quick Step is riding, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, you can never count out Sagan. So yeah. I do have a pick of my own. I, <clears throat> I would like to hear it. Wow, Van Ert. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I guess it's not a flow bike show if we don't talk about WAT. That's exactly. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, man. Yeah, I mean, ninth at Flanders. He's been you know, pretty much top 10 at every classics race he's done. Uh, this is sort of his last road race of the season for a while. Who knows when he'll be back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the other thing that's mm. been super impressive is his team has been riding phenomenally. That's true. There. I mean, even at Flanders, I mean, they're really rallying around him, seeing them just drive it on the front, helping him position for these climbs. So that's sort of been the coolest thing for me to see is this pro continental team just going toe to toe with the world tour teams and uh, riding in support of Wout and then having him deliver. That, so That's been rad. And yeah, I, I actually like that pick. I don't have anything to say with that, especially, do we know what the weather's going to do? Down. It would, if it looks muddy. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Well, like if there's just a little bit of chaos, because right, right now, if there are four quick step guys in the lead group with 20k to go, I don't see. Uh, it, it'll be hard for anyone, especially wow. But if if there's like some chaos from the weather. Yeah. Yeah. If it's anyone's game, why not wow? Yeah. That would. I like, yeah. Why not wow? I why like not wow? Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah. Flow bikes. Okay. So uh, let's wrap up. Uh, we've got some um, not happy news or just uh, not, you know, the Froome news, I guess. His yeah. uh, case went to the Court of Arbitration for sport last week. Um, I mean, it, it's, we've been talking about this for months now. It's, it's nice to see that his case is finally moving along. And the UCI basically rejected um, whatever excuse he gave as to why his salbutamol levels were, what, ten, four times the maximum allowed limit, so. Yeah. So the arbitration continues. Yeah. In, um, in new court. Uh, yeah, they say maybe not resolved until after the tour, so. I guess Frame's gonna just line up at the Giro and <laughs> I mean at least there keep was keep on keeping on until then. Uh, yeah. At least there was some movement. So um, yeah, let's just hope this continues to move and, and become resolved and kudos to the UCI at least. I mean I feel like ten years ago there probably would have been more obfuscation and uh, potential corruption and whatever and this was sort of you know this was sat on for long enough, but now it's sort of just like, yeah. There's going to be an up or down vote, so mm -hmm. yeah, we'll have some resolution. Until then, yeah. Um, finally, thank you, Benjamin Cubs, for this amazing Harry Potter coffee mug. And Sally Docker to you, uh, the winners of our coffee mug competition. Check out our show on FlowBikes.com, and we will have the address where you can send us your special coffee mug if you would like it to be featured on Ian and Friends. Yeah. All right, cheers. Cheers. Good job. <laughs>